Okay, well, I have two o'clock on the dot. So uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Dan Gilbert, and I am a senior program manager here at the After School Alliance. Uh, and I coordinate the administration of the New York Life Foundation's incredible Aim High grant program and the review process, along with a few other members of our team. So um, just a few housekeeping notes uh, before we get started. Um, please enter any questions you may have for us um, in the question and answer box, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we know that many of you will have questions during the limited time we do have together on today's webinar. Um, and so um, uh, the FAQ section of the RFP will be updated with any unanswered questions uh, that we do receive. Um, so we're going to get to as many questions as we can, um, but we definitely uh, would be surprised if we got to all of them. So keep an eye out for that updated FAQ that we will be sending out as a follow up to today's webinar. The webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to your email and will also be made available on our website. Um, our current Zoom platform only allows for 500 attendees. Um, so if you have a colleague who is unable to join the webinar via Zoom, they can attend via the Facebook live stream of the event, the link for which will be plugged into the chat periodically. Um, and the last housekeeping note is to just please make sure that you have your chat settings set to go to all panelists and attendees, um, just to make sure that everyone uh, in the audience can see your uh, questions and answers to each other. Just make sure that everybody has that available. So um, today's webinar presentation will feature two pre presenters. Um, in addition to myself, we are also fortunate enough to be joined by Marlene Torres, a senior program officer of the New York Life Foundation, who is also one of the chief architects of the AIM High grant program. So, so excited to have Marlon with us. And to give you a quick look at the order of operations for today's webinar, here we have the agenda. So uh, Marlin will be kicking us off uh, with a quick overview with the AIM High grant program, uh, the program's goals, and how it fits in with the New York Life Foundation's other investments in out-of-school time programming. Um, I'm going to build off of this with a few other notes and reminders, and then we're going to move on to kind of our tested and true tips for prospective applicants uh, to the program, uh, which we've honed over uh, the past five years um, of offering the program. Um, from there, I'm going to kick off to a quick run through of the most common questions that we do receive from pros prospective applicants uh, and give some general feedback from our experience with managing previous rounds of the program. And lastly, I'm going to give a, give a couple final notes and reminders for prospective applicants, and then we're going to open up the floor for your questions. Um, as I mentioned, the question and answer portion of the webinar will be managed exclusively through the Q&A box. So we're going to do our best to get through as many of the questions as we can. And if you feel you still have any outstanding questions after the webinar ends that aren't addressed in the updated FAQ, uh, you can please feel free to email us at aimhigh at afterschoolalliance.org. Um, which will be displayed on the Q&A slide at the end of the webinar and is also available on the awards homepage and on the PDF of the RFP. And we'll also be plugging that into the chat box periodically as well. So please take advantage of that and reach out to us if you have any questions. So uh, with that, I'm gonna be handing it over to Marlin to give us the big picture view of the AIM High grant program. So Marlin. Thank you, Dan, and welcome to the webinar. I'm so happy to see everyone filling in their name and affiliation in the chat box. So I think we have all 50 states represented. So good morning, good afternoon. We've spanned all the time zones. Uh, so I'm ex excited to share with you today information on the foundation's AIM High grant program. The AIM High program supports local out of school time programs that help middle school students prepare for high school and life. Research indicates that disadvantaged students benefit from more learning time in the form of high quality and after, after school and summer programs. And this leads to greater academic achievement, better school attendance, more engaged students, and better students overall in terms of their well being. AIM High is in its sixth year, and this year the grant program will provide nearly $2 million in grants to out-of-school time programs. 40 awards will be made nationwide through a competitive application process, which will, which will go over in more detail in the following slides. To give some perspective, uh, last year we received uh, 
540 applications for 26 awards. So it is a very competitive program um, indeed. Uh, so continuing, um, the AIM High program really complements the foundation's ongoing national investments in supporting out-of-school time programs that work with middle school youth. Our mission as a company is to provide financial security and peace of mind through our financial products. And these values are aligned with the work that we do through the foundation. After school and summer programs help build young people's foundational skills. And again, we see that research reveals that students who get to ninth grade prepared and on time and on track are four times more likely to graduate from high school. Uh, Marlin, I do want to interrupt. We are getting a lot of comments from folks in the chat box that you're a little hard to hear. Um, do you think, is there any way for you to increase your volume or would it be uh, easier for me to tackle this section? I don't know, I defer to you. Um, is that um, clearer or louder? Can let's someone... see what the, okay. We're getting lots of yeses. Okay, um, great. So sorry about that. Um, certainly want to shout it from the mountaintops about our AIM and... program. Um, so uh, to continue, um, the research reveals that students who get to ninth grade uh, prepared on time and on track are four times more likely to graduate from high school. And this is an important step which puts students on the right path for academic and future financial success. Since 2013. Um, Marlin, do you think you could hold, just hold the mic up next to your mouth? Okay. <laughs> Sorry to bother you. That's okay. Is, is that any better? Yes, definitely. Okay. So, um, since it was uh, difficult for some people to hear, can you go back to the overview slide, the initial slide? I don't want folks to feel like they missed out on anything. Okay, and then the next slide. Great. Um, so for those that heard me the first time, pretend like it's the first time. So sorry about that. Uh, but I do wanna be sure that everybody gets the information. So again, excited to be here with you today to share more information about the AIM High RFP program. And in a nutshell, the AIM High program supports local out-of-school time programs that help middle school students prepare for high school and prepare them for life in general. Research indicates that disadvantaged students benefit from more learning time in the form of high quality after school and summer programs, which help them and it all leads to uh, the students achieving, um, having greater academic achievement, better school attendance, and more engaged students. AIM High is in its sixth year, and the grant program will provide nearly 2 million in grants to out-of-school time programs across the country. 40 awards will be made nationwide through a competitive application process, which, will go, which we will go over in more detail in the upcoming slides. But to give some perspective, last year we received over 540 applications for 26 awards. So it is a, a competitive program. Um, next, um, again, so the AIM High program really complements the foundation's ongoing national investments in supporting out-of-school time programs that work with middle school youth. Our mission is a as a company is to provide financial security and peace of mind through these products. Um, these values are clearly aligned with the work that we do at the foundation. After school and summer programs really help build young people's foundational skills, both academically and socially. Again, we see that research reveals that students who get to ninth grade on time and on track for high school are four times more likely to graduate from high school. And this puts them on a path for uh, not only high school graduation and college success, but success in life. Since 2013, the New York Life Foundation has invested over 60 million in national middle school time 
uh, excuse me, middle school, out of school time efforts, supporting organizations that provide thousands of middle school students with after school and summer programming. So the AIM High uh, program was created to support local and smaller programs that fall outside of our uh, traditional national level uh, grants. So for those smaller community-based programs that fall outside of this uh, geographic scope in terms of a national organization. The RFP helps us broaden the investments and reach more communities as well. So we look at programs that can track, measure, and report against what we know are key indicators for success in high school. These factors include, but are not limited to, academic performance, school attendance, on-time graduation to ninth grade, and uh, developing strong social and emotional skills. So with that said, we know that uh, many programs have been and continue to be disrupted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the information that you usually track for your students may not look the same as in past years. And we're cognizant of that. It may be incomplete or perhaps you're starting to track different indicators. So please just tell us what you're able to track and share what you can in this regard. We certainly wanna be sensitive to um, all of you and, and how you're navigating the, this current environment. So it is important for us to pause and reflect on this moment and acknowledge the impact, the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on out-of-school time programs. We know that out-of-school time programs and the youth, families, and communities that you serve continue to face challenges in the wake of the pandemic, including coping with loss. Many young people have lost a parent or a caregiver, a significant person in their family, uh, a loved one has died. And we must you know, take a moment and, and recognize that. Um, are experiencing financial hardship. Um, you all are navigating how to have in-person, virtual or hybrid programming and so much more. We also acknowledge the unique ways that your programs have pivoted to meet the immediate needs of youth and families. And applicants are encouraged to share the ways in which they have and will continue to support youth in the wake of the pandemic, as we all work together to ensure that youth continue to have opportunities to help them grow and thrive. So uh, now uh, Dan will walk us through more specifics of what we're looking for and we'll provide tips in drafting the best application. But one more thing before I turn it over to Dan, I just wanna point out a new aspect of the program for 2022. And on the next slide, um, you'll see that this year there'll uh, be 20 awards for the one year $15,000 category. Um, and this will continue to support projects that focus on racial equity and social justice efforts. Uh, the foundation recognizes that we're living in a pivotal, pivotal time when it's imperative for us to continue to build on our legacy of support for marginalized communities and communities of color as part of our ongoing commitment to support an equal and just society. Understanding the unique role that after school and summer learning programs play in addressing equity, the $15,000 one year grants category um, will be dedicated to supporting programs in their efforts around advancing racial equity and social justice. And notably moving forward each year, 10 of the 20 grants in this category will support racial equity and social justice efforts, permanently establishing this focus and the remaining 10 grants in this category in the future will support emerging trends in the out of school time field. So we'll have a dual focus. So now at this point, I'll turn it over to Dan and I'll be here later in the presentation to answer any questions. So I wanna thank all of you for the work that you do. 
um, to support the youth and families that you serve. And we look forward to learning more about your programs and the work that you uh, do in your communities. Dan? Thank you so much, Marlon, for that introduction and for your incredible work with the foundation that's made the AIM High Grant Program possible. Um, so first off, I wanna quickly run us through the timeline just to make sure that you all know exactly what to expect going into the AIM High Grant application process. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, the RFP is currently open and it will remain open until 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday, February 1st of 2022. Oh, I think February 1st is actually a Tuesday. Let me double check that real quick. Yes, Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. Uh, the review process will include a diverse set of experts from the out of school time field um, and experts in youth programmatic strategies um, for promoting racial and social justice for the one year grants in particular. Uh, the vetting and review process for the grants um, will between take uh, about three months to complete. Uh, so you can expect to hear back from us about the status of your application by the beginning of June, 2022. Um, you should have heard back. Uh, for grant recipients, there are two possible grant periods. So uh, the grant period for both of the two-year grants uh, will begin in June, 2022 and end in May of 2024. And the grant period for the one-year grant focused on support, supporting programs in their efforts around advancing racial equity and social justice will begin in June, 2022 and end in May, 2023. Uh, grant recipients for all three grant categories will be required to submit progress reports uh, throughout the duration of the grant period, um, two reports per year plus one final report. Ooh, computer going a little crazy. So um, in terms of uh, eligibility requirements, so first off, all applicants must be registered as 501c3 organizations. Um, that includes schools and school districts. If a school or district is not registered as a 501c3 organization, it is not eligible to apply unless it has a dedicated 501c3 foundation to support its work. Um, second, applicants must either currently serve middle school aged youth or must use AIM High grant funds to begin serving youth in this age range. For the purposes of the AIM High grant program, youth are considered to be middle school aged uh, starting at the, the summer before sixth grade and ending on the first day of ninth grade. Um, third, applicants must serve low income youth. In order to be eligible for the program, 75% uh, or more of the youth served by the applying program uh, must be eligible for free and reduced price lunches. And lastly, um, applicants must not currently receive funding from the New York Life Foundation, either directly or as pass-through funding from a parent organization uh, if you're an a member of an affiliate organization. So if you have any questions about the eligibility requirements or wanna know details about what exceptions may exist for any of these rules, um, I would encourage all of you to take a look at uh, Appendix D of the RFP um, or the standalone FAQ, uh, which provides questions like these um, and, and outlines any exceptions that may exist. Um, and if you have any questions that are not addressed in the FAQ or doing the question and answer portion at the end of today's webinar, um, I once again would encourage you to email us directly at aimhigh at afterschoolalliance.org. So um, this year's grant program will include $1,800,000 um, spread across 40 separate grants for out of school time programs. Um, the chart you see on the screen here can be found on page four of the PDF of the request for proposals. Um, so in this year's RFP, like last year, we have three different types of grants, um, uh, although we've increased how many of, of some of the grants are offered. So we have 10 two-year grants of $50,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $100,000. To be eligible for this, the largest grant here, you must both have an annual organizational budget of more than $500,000 and an annual program budget of at least $250,000. 
Uh, we also have 10 two-year grants of $25,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $50,000. Um, to be eligible for these grants, you must have an annual organizational budget of at least $250,000, and there is no minimum program budget to be eligible for those uh, $25,000 per year grants. And last, we have 20 one-year grants uh, for $15,000 each. These ones are specifically focused on sp uh, helping programs to improve the supports they provide to youth related to social justice and racial equity efforts. And so that is the specific focus of the one-year grants. Uh, for the purposes of the AIM High grant program, uh, both organizational budget and program budget are defined by annual expenses rather than revenues. And the budget that you should use to meet these eligibility requirements should be from your most recently completed fiscal year. Uh, and next, I'm going to run through the eligibility requirements that an organization or program needs to meet in order to be eligible for the program. So AIM High grant funds may be used for either technical assistance, enhancing direct service activities, or both. Um, for the purposes of both of the two-year grants, technical assistance includes things like program enhancements, operations enhancements, and governance enhancements. And funds may also be used for enhancing direct service activities, capacity building, and or program expansion, should a program be in a position to do so with a specific focus on supporting programs efforts to continue to serve youth uh, in, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, direct service components include things like uh, addressing the unique needs of youth arising from the pandemic, uh, developing or improving virtual and in-person programming, and enhancing program to better support students transition to the ninth grade. Um, so obviously there's a lot of flexibility around what is an eligible use of funding here. Um, and and uh, we leave it to your discretion as to figure out what the most compelling way uh, uh, to, to, uh, to use the funds within your proposal. Uh, I do wanna state upfront, however, that AIM High grant funds for all three tiers are not to be used to support programming that happens during the traditional school day. Um, and furthermore, it is specifically intended to support programming for middle school aged youth. Um, for the purposes of this uh, grant, again, youth are considered to be middle school aged starting when they leave school on the last day of fifth grade and ending on the first day of ninth grade. So both the summer before sixth grade and the summer after eighth grade are uh, considered eligible uh, times for, for um, this funding to be used. So uh, like the two-year grants, the one-year grant funds may be used for either technical assistance, enhancing direct service activities, or both. Um, the acceptable direct service components are the same as for the two-year grants, uh, with the exception that the one-year grants have a slightly more restrictive usage of technical assistance funds. Uh, for the purposes of the one-year grants, unlike the two-year grants, technical assistance does not include operations or governance enhancements. So that is not an eligible use for funds under the one-year grant category. They do, however, uh, still include program enhancements such as supports that help your organization implement practices that address racial equity and inclusion, um, program initiatives that engage youth in creating youth-led social justice and civic engagement solutions to local challenges. Um, other things that it could be used for um, are, are programming that helps you thrive in the face of trauma related to social and racial uh, injustice and historic disparities, and also training for program staff on anti-racism, uh, racial equity, diversity, inclusion, and healing-centered engagement. So these are all examples of things uh, that are eligible uses of funding. This is not a complete list of the things that the funding can be used for. And if you have any questions for us about eligible uses of funding uh, for either the one-year or the two-year grants, um, feel free to reach out to us and we'll attempt to clarify. So now that I've gone through the ins and outs of the grants, um, we're going to move into providing some recommendations and suggestions for you all. Um, so the tips, recommendations, and best practices that I lay out in this portion of the presentation are drawn largely from the After School Alliance's long history of reviewing applications for grants and awards, um, both the AIM High grant program and, and some others that we've done um, over the years. So here are our top five tips for you going into the RFP. So number one, uh, all questions have a unique purpose. 
you should approach each open-ended question as an opportunity for you to explain and illustrate the value of your program. So we encourage you to make sure to read the full RFP and, and go through all of the questions before you start writing your answers. So you gain a better understanding of what reviewers will be looking for in each question. And so that you don't have to go back and revise your answers to questions that may be addressed by, by other questions uh, later on in the application. Uh, and when you read through the application in advance, um, you can see not only the specifics of what each question is asking for, but also how the questions throughout the application fit together uh, to give you a good understanding of how to approach each question. Uh, number two, um, just make sure to be an advocate. Um, it's vital to give reviewers a complete picture of the great work that your program does. So you wanna make sure to share details of how the program is helping to meet the needs of your community. Um, also think about ways to differentiate your program from other applicants. Um, so when available, it can also be great to find the best places within the ap application to demonstrate the program's impact through quantitative or qualitative data, um, but make sure it's relevant to the question that you're answering because reviewers are always uh, thrown off when you provide uh, information and an answer that isn't relevant to the question that's posed. Um, keep in mind that reviewers don't just want you to provide a list of program activities and outcome data. It's your job to bring your program to life for them. And so reviewers become more attached to programs that not only uh, provide descriptions of activities and data on the program successes, but also give them the information that they need to really understand what the day-to-day -day experiences of youth in those programs are. Um, so just definitely keep those in mind. Uh, number three, um, provide lots of specifics. Um, details really matter. We rely on your applications to give reviewers a complete and concrete picture of what your program looks like. Um, it's also absolutely crucial that you don't assume that reviewers know anything in particular about your program, your curriculum, your community. Um, definitely try to avoid jargon, try to avoid uh, using too many acronyms without explaining them. Um, and if you have great outcomes data, or a strong answer to how your program addresses a specific prompt, reviewers rely on you to convey that information in a compelling way that helps them understand the true value uh, that your program brings to your youth and your community. Uh, number four um, is to keep uh, your answers to all questions relevant. Um, in any grant application, ambiguity is gonna be your enemy as an applicant. Um, so make sure you're clear in your answers and always keep in mind the specific goals and priorities of the RFP and the intent of each question when answering them. Uh, so it can be tempting to go off on a tangent and describe all of the great things that your organization does or impacts that your organization has that are outside of the scope of the given grant opportunity. Um, but for the reviewers, every word is a precious opportunity for you to give them pertinent information the, that addresses the particular questions at hand. So not only is keeping it relevant helpful for you as an applicant answering the questions uh, while keeping within those word limits, but it's also helpful re for reviewers to easily identify the point that you're trying to make in your answer to each question. And uh, tip number five, the final tip here, um, is to read and reread and have someone else read and then read your application again and again. Um, so we've all been there the moment when you press the send or submit button and you immediately notice the typo. Um, so it's great to review your application multiple times before submitting your answers. It can also be great to ask your colleagues or even someone outside of your organization, if available, to review your answers prior to submitting the application. Because a fresh set of eyes is a great, uh, not just for finding those little errors that drive us all crazy, but also for finding places where you can fortify your application providing, by providing additional details or context and making sure that uh, the, the entirety of your application kind of flows well. Um, another reason for having someone else read your application is to, again, help you avoid jargon. It's important to make sure that your answers to the questions in the application are clear and concise. So um, before we move on to the FAQs, I just wanted to give a quick reminder um, to you all about two particular questions within the application. Um, so within the RFP, um, we have provided uh, downloadable sample charts and downloadable template charts for you to refer uh, to in your answers 
for both section D, project description and expected outcomes, and section F, which is the budget and narrative section. Um, so the sample charts give you a good idea of how to fill in the details of a high quality answer for questions D1 and F1 respectively. Um, and you will need to upload both of these documents within the application system using the templates that we've provided. So again, the links to both the samples and to the templates can be found within the RFP. Um, if you've applied in the past, this is a new feature and hopefully it's easier um, than having to fill out the chart in the application itself. So um, in this section, common questions, I'm gonna be delving quickly into the answers of the most frequent questions that we receive about the AIM High Grant Program. And for your reference, most of these questions and answers can be found in Appendix D on page 40 of the full request for proposals. So um, first things first, how many grants will be given? Um, so we will have, oh, I did not update this. Um, my sincerest apologies, this is not the correct information. Um, it is 10 grants of $50,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $100,000, so that's 10 grants. Uh, there are also 10 grants of $25,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $50,000, and then there are 20 one-year grants of $15,000. So apologies again that the information here is not right. The information within the FAQ is correct on this one. Um, are nonprofit organizations that are not 501c3 eligible to apply? Um, no, unfortunately, only 501c3 organizations are eligible to apply for the AIM High grants. Um, and I'm going to tag team with Marlin on this one and, and let uh, Marlin tackle the next slide. Folks can hear me better now. Definitely louder. Thank you. Okay, great. So can multiple programs or program sites from the same organization submit applications separately? The answer here is no. Each organization as determined by the EIN number can only submit one application. However, if an applicant is an affiliate of a national organization, more than one affiliate is able to apply for funding so long as that affiliate is currently not receiving grant funds from the New York Life Foundation. So for those that are affiliates, check with national. If an organization has multiple affiliates or regional entities with distinct EIN numbers, tax ID numbers, one application may be submitted for each tax ID. Thank you, Marlon. So uh, next, uh, are organizations with annual budgets of less than $150,000 eligible to apply for any of the grants? And the answer is no. Uh, unfortunately, if your most recent fiscal year um, has a budget of less than $150,000, um, you are not eligible to apply. The minimum organizational budget to be eligible for the lowest tier of the grants is $150,000. And back to you, Marlon. Sure. So is the program budget or the organizational budget that will need to be uh, met, to, you will need to meet the budget requirement? So we get this question a lot um, and we're happy to answer it again after the webinar because I know it's a lot of information and uh, confusing sometimes. Uh, but for the one year $15,000 grant category and the two year $50,000 grants, it is the full organization's operating budget from the most recent fiscal year that determines eligibility. So for most organizations, this will be the final fiscal year um, 20, well, from your final fiscal year budget. Um, then for the two year $100,000 grants, Applicants must meet the budget minimum for both the organizational budget and the program budget. So that's the difference for the grant categories. And again, it, more details are in the RFP. Dan? Yeah, and if you have any questions about those, again, feel free to reach out to us, aim high at afterschoolalliance.org. Um, so what is the geographic scope of the grants? 
Uh, so applicants will be accepted from anywhere within the 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, applicants from US territories are ineligible to apply. Um, and also just wanted to note the New York Life Foundation reserves the right to provide an additional five points to certain applications based on the location and geographic distribution of applicants. Um, so this is just part of, uh, again, that strategy that the, the AIM High Grant Program is part of the foundation strategy to make sure that they're reaching um, communities uh, uh, all around the country. And we want to make sure that we're uh, cognizant of that. And back to you, Marlon. So continuing with some of the common questions, are schools, school districts, or government agencies eligible to apply? So only if they're registered as 501c3 organization. So some school districts have a philanthropic fundraising arm, as well as some um, local government agencies. So again, it's the 501c3, the nonprofit entity that can apply. Can 501c3 organizations serve as a fiduciary agent or programs run by organizations that are not 501c3? So no, the 501c3 organization must be the applying program provider. So again, any technical or specific questions or nuances to any of these, feel free to reach out. Dan? Thank you so much, Marlon. And uh, lastly, and uh, often the most common question we get, can you get a recording of this webinar? Um, yes, we are recording the webinar and the link will be both sent to you via email and a follow-up and also will be posted on the After School Alliance's webinars page um, where you probably registered for this webinar in the first place. So um, moving on to some feedback that we've gotten from our reviewers um, about applicants and, and successful application strategies in past years. And we'll be moving on to the Q&A from the audience once we uh, draw up uh, to the end of this and, and one more just quick things to remember. Um, so first off, um, in the first uh, five rounds uh, of the AIM High Grant Program, we were blessed with a wealth of high quality applications from all over the country. Um, and with hundreds of applications submitted each year are all across the country. In uh, five years, we've now given out 132 grants to out of school time programs. Um, so it's important to make sure to double check everything to make sure your application is top notch and can really stand out from the crowd. So um, uh, first off, I wanna reiterate um, that, review, it, that the reviewers who will ultimately be reading your application, we start out on your side. Um, if it were up to us here at the Alliance or Marlin and her colleagues at the Foundation or any member of our review panel, we would love to see each and every applicant receive the funding they need to continue serving youth. And so reviewers job is really to narrow the field. We're not going to going through and picking favorites so much as we're trying to provide an objective score to each section of the application and weighing them according to the rubric that is aligned with the point values that were provided in the application itself. So we're trying to see your alignment uh, with all of the, the foci of the AIM High Grant Program and making sure that your application is a good fit. So your job as an applicant is both to provide thorough answers for each question that addresses all of the different as aspects of the questions as they are asked, and also to provide a bigger picture and details throughout the application that give the reviewers the, the information that they need, not only to score your application highly, but also to advocate for it and promote it in discussions with other reviewers. So applicants um, uh, that have seen the most successful uh, are often those that specifically address the eighth to ninth grade transition, which is ob obviously um, the main focus of the AIM High program. Um, applicants that focus their answers on benefits of services provided to middle school aged youth in particular uh, also benefit. Um, it, it's good to make sure that you're focusing on those middle school youth, even if your program also serves elementary and high school age youth. Um, and also uh, for new and very young programs or those that just starting started serving middle school youth um, sometimes have more difficulty um, than, than others uh, standing out from the crowd. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, they, they don't uh, uh, sometimes receive funds and things like that. Um, it's just uh, it, sometimes it's good to have a track record of success and really uh, know what a program looks like um, from, from the applicant and the reviewer perspective. Um, so the number one reason that applicants lost points is res providing responses that don't address the specifics of the questions as they are posed. 
Um, so while we know that it's tempting to simply run with a so-called plug and play language um, that you may have from your applications uh, to other grant uh, programs, it, it's very important to take the time to tweak your language and making sure that your language is a good fit for the question that it's answering. Um, and paying attention to the specific aspects, including some of those like bullets uh, around things, the types of things that we're looking for in different questions. Um, the specific aspects of the questions that you need to address, um, just make sure to pay a lot of attention to that. It's fine to include details that are outside the scope of the question, so long as those details are uh, A, thematically aligned with the question itself, and B, your question also addresses every aspect of the question that's posed. So if you don't answer a question, but also provide erroneous details, um, reviewers may dock a, a few points for that. Um, so it's important to recognize that when you omit a response to a particular question, that reviewers have no way of knowing um, uh, if you, you're, program or your organization genuinely don't have a good answer to that question, or if uh, you uh, simply accidentally left out those details. Um, so it's leaving it up to the reviewer to figure out whether or not you're trying to dodge the question or uh, whether or not you simply forgot to answer it properly. Um, so, and before we dive into the question and answer, uh, I just want to make one last second to highlight the most important kind of highlights uh, for you to remember as you prepare your questions for this year's RFP. Um, so the due date, again, um, uh, Tuesday, February 1st, 2022 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, draft, edit, review. Uh, make sure you download the application RFP and you review all of the questions um, and draft your answers with time to spare. Um, just make sure you have time to go through everything and make sure your questions provide clear answers to the questions they correspond to. Um, Data really matters. The strongest applications often include robust program data, um, both qualitative and or quantitative data. Um, so make sure to provide that if you have it. Um, and don't assume anything about the information and background of our reviewers. Um, so review, there will be reviewers who are unfamiliar with your program. Um, so make sure you provide detailed information that will help reviewers gain a stronger understanding of the supports your program provides. So um, with that, um, we are moving on to the Q&A portion where uh, Marlin and I will try to go through as many of the questions we've received in the um, uh, Q&A box as possible. Um, and so uh, make sure that you ask your questions in the Q&A box if you want us to get to them. We will unfortunately be unable to take uh, questions from the chat box. So just wanted to flag that one more time. And with that, I am going to open up uh, the floor. So um, Marlin, feel free, since we're trying to get to as many as we can in the next 20 minutes, um, feel free to just uh, jump in and answer any questions that you may see um, that are um, uh, easy to, to get to. So I'm going to start diving in myself and see what we can find. So first I see uh, unable to access the outcomes chart and the budget chart, so provide those links. Um, so I'm going to ask someone from uh, our support team uh, here to go into the RFP and go down to one of the applications. And you can find those links um, under question D1 and under question F1. Um, so those will be easy to get to. So um, uh, our organization received, uh, oh, go ahead, Marlin. Well, um, I have two questions that I have are coming up a lot. So I'll address those since lots of folks seem to have that question. So a number of um, folks are asking since a free lunch is now being offered to all students, there isn't data available. Um, so many school districts uh, across the country um, fall into this category or pro, you know, programs as well. So um, in this case, if you if there is a proxy for this, you can use that um, and just provide as much detail as you can um, without it being onerous on the um, economic demographics of the community that you serve in general. So um, we understand that free lunch is now being offered to all students. So um, uh, you can do your best in terms of um, pointing to another proxy that, that you do have access to in terms of income. Um, Dan, do you want to elaborate on that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so we don't have a specific definition of an acceptable proxy. Um, so it's to a certain extent your job to um, make the case for that need. Um, I do want to flag um, here in the uh, chat box, I am going to be plugging in 
This is a link to the kind of poverty guidelines on which the free and reduced price lunch is calculated. Um, so uh, children and families that are below 185% of the poverty level in the United States are free and reduced price lunch. And that roughly calculates out um, to, for a family of four, it's about $50,000 a year. Um, so just as you're trying to make the case or trying to figure out whether or not you can make the case uh, that you meet those requirements, if your program doesn't have FRPL data, um, but they do have access to some info, uh, income data on the youth that you serve, um, you can pay attention to that. Um, yeah. And then I'll ask, I'll, I'll um, ask so the others have the benefit of hearing it, another common question that's come up a lot, and then I'll kick it over to you, Dan. Um, in terms of the fiscal year, some folks are asking if they could submit a pre-pandemic uh, budget, um, and, and the answer is no. Um, we need to know your current budget, so your current fiscal year budget. Um, we know a lot of folks took a hit, um, but we need to have the most recent financial information. So a lot of folks are asking that. So your most um, current fiscal year information is the information that we need. Um, so Dan. Thank you so much, Marlon. And then I also uh, realized that I had um, uh, a few questions that we had received from applicants in advance that I wanted to comb through. Um, we already got to one of them, but I just wanted to make sure that we touched on them uh, because I think that some of them are also important for everyone to know as they're approaching all sorts of questions. Um, so we got a question in advance um, from someone uh, asking about question C2 in the application. So um, question C2 is asking about data about the community uh, that you serve. Um, in questions like C C2, we have these um, bulleted uh, list of things that we're looking for. Um, those are such as, things we're looking for such, that we want you to provide such as lists. Those are not all required. Um, so make sure you pay attention to the language there. Um, there's a few questions um, in the application where we're, we give you examples of things we're looking for in the question, um, but none of them are mandatory things to include. So just pay attention to that. Um, Another question we got uh, on question E1, which is in the evaluation uh, section, um, is each data point given the same weight and are programs expected to collect all data or is there a penalty for collecting less? Um, so reviewers will take a holistic view, uh, not only of what data is collected, but also how that data is used. Um, so there's no specific weighing system for the data points that your program collects or doesn't collect. And reviewers generally prioritize effective use of data over the amount of data that you collect. So as long as you can make a compelling case um, that you are using data effectively in some sort of uh, uh, feedback loop or in some sort of quality assurance uh, system or process, um, that's what we're looking for uh, more holistically is what reviewers tend to look for. Um, in uh, question uh, E, uh, in section four, um, uh, we had a question, uh, could grants go towards an uh, enhancement of data collection and longitudinal analysis or program evaluation? Um, and so the answer to that is yes. Um, enhancements of program uh, eligible use of funding uh, includes things like program evaluation, um, data collection, quality improvement systems um, uh, are all eligible uses of funding. Um, then uh, we also got a question, a good question about uh, question E5, um, which is the one in which we ask you to lay out how you can, uh, whether, either whether you are already collecting or uh, how your program plans to begin collecting uh, data on the successful transition from eighth to ninth grade of the youth that you serve. Um, so there is no particular data point that is required uh, for you to already be collecting in order to be eligible for AIM High grants. Um, but uh, the, if you do receive an AIM High grant uh, from any of the three tiers, the only data point that, that the foundation does require all grant recipients to track um, is how many youth um, successfully matriculate to ninth grade from eighth grade on time. Um, so just pay attention to that. So um, moving on to questions that we have received today. Um, so uh, we unfortunately are not able to give individual feedback to past applicants. We just don't have capacity to do that, given that last year, for example, um, we got over 540 applications. Um, so it's just very, we just unfortunately don't have time to give that individualized feedback. 
Um, hopefully, uh, some of the broad strokes feedback um, that we uh, provided on today's webinar will help, however. Uh, Marlon, any questions that you notice while I'm continuing to comb through? Sure. So um, one is uh, if an organization partners, a nonprofit partners with another nonprofit to implement the program, can both apply for funding for the same program? The answer is no. So you'll need to pick one organization to apply for funding. And then another question is, um, oh wait, where did it go? Um, can the program be held offsite or does it have to be the program take place in the middle school? Um, no, it, it could be either school-based or um, uh, at a program site in the community. So it doesn't have to necessarily be in a school, in a middle school. It could be a program that just serves middle school youth in wherever it finds itself. So um, that was one question that came up a few times. Thanks, Marlon. Another question that we have, um, it sounds like there's a few people on today's webinar that uh, have actually received AIM High grants in the past. Um, so uh, to be eligible to apply, there is a mandatory one-year hiatus, uh, meaning that your last AIM High grant has to um, have expired in May of last year, or May of this year, May 2021, um, in order for you to be eligible to apply for this year's grants. Um, if, you're, if you are still within one of your AIM High grant periods as of right now, um, you uh, are not eligible to apply for this year's grants, but will be again eligible next year. So you have to go one year unfunded by the AIM High grant program in order to reapply. Um, I'm noticing just a quick question here um, uh, about uh, the question I was referring to earlier was question C2. Um, so question C2 uh, lists a number of things that we would, uh, that are examples of what we'd like to know about community need, um, but those are not mandatory things for you to supply. And that's the case for some other questions as well. We have examples of things we'd like to see in a response to a question, um, but that are not um, uh, mandatory things for you to know about or report on. Um, let's see. So we have done that. Um, we, uh, so uh, just a quick reminder for everyone in the RFP, we lay this out, um, but a question, um, we determine uh, whether or not your, uh, the, whether or not you meet a budget requirement is determined by expenses, not by um, uh, revenues. So another thing to keep in mind for eligibility requirements. Let's see, Marlon, feel free to, to jump in. Sure. Um, one uh, that's, that's folks are asking here if you if you receive twenty first century funding, will you still qualify for this grant? Yes, you're still eligible to apply for the grant. Um, it's just if you re are receiving current um, grant funds from the foundation, but other public funding wouldn't impact your eligibility for this program on our end. Um, I see a question here. Um, is there a preference for programs that already have proven success in meeting key indicators for student success? Or is it okay to describe the plan to start recording these metrics at the beginning of the funding period? Um, so as I mentioned, the only mandatory data point uh, for, for grantees to track is uh, that successful eighth to ninth grade transition. Um, certainly reviewers give uh, 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 it is a positive aspect for reviewers when an, uh, an applicant already has um, uh, a demonstrated success uh, in uh, doing key indicators for student success in the lead up to ninth grade. Um, but uh, it is certainly uh, acceptable if you aren't already tracking those indicators to, to begin tracking them. Um, again, none of these are, are required other than that eighth to ninth grade transition. Let's see. 
Um, so uh, I see a comment here that is actually one we get pretty often. Um, can you confirm the eligibility of Boys and Girls Clubs of America uh, affiliates since the New York Life Foundation funds Boys and Girls Club of America? Um, so the Be There Grief program, and there may also be some other programs, Marlon, if you know off the top of your head, um, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, so as long as your, if your Boys and Girls Club affiliate receives um, Be There pro, uh, program funding uh, that originates with the New York Life Foundation, then unfortunately you would be, you would be considered a current grant recipient and would be un, ineligible to apply for this year's grants. So if you aren't sure if you're a Boys and Girls Club affiliate or an affiliate of another national organization, and you're not sure whether any of the funding that you receive from the national uh, organization um, is passed through funding from a New York Life Foundation grant, um, definitely reach out to the national organization and check with them to make sure, um, because you would be considered ineligible if you currently receive some of that passed through funding. Yeah, and just to add on to that and clarify, so you can certainly be using, um, you know, the Be There materials and, and things like that. But um, if you're currently not receiving funding, and my understanding is I was just in touch with National um, recently, that that grant has, um, that grant cycle has ended. So all technically all boys and girls clubs are eligible to apply. Great, that's good to know. Oh, you communicated that with national, so perhaps um, you're getting, uh, you'll be getting that information soon, um, but just wanted to share that as well. Thank you, Marlon. Um, and similarly, another question about uh, a specific type of applicants, uh, of which there are many, um, are university-based programs eligible to apply? Um, so long as those programs uh, are either our 501c3 organization, uh, are operated by 501c3 organizations, or if the university has its own dedicated 501c3 foundation, which is often the case, um, then you would be considered eligible to, to apply. Um, in this scenario, this is the only instance in which we allow um, uh, fiscal agents or fiduciary agents um, is if uh, an applicant isn't a 501c3 organization, um, but they would want to apply with a fiscal agent. Uh, the only situation where that is permitted is if the fiscal agent uh, was founded and solely exists to support the work of that organization. So think some school districts have dedicated foundations, uh, many universities have dedicated foundations. So that's the only scenario um, in which fiscal agency is permitted under the AIM High Grant Program. Yeah. And just to add to the university question, so the, the spirit of the AIM High Grant Program is to get um, grant funding to providers um, that are in communities serving children, direct service providers. So um, that is the primary focus and spirit of this grant application. So um, that uh, will impact the, 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 the review. So in, in terms of university programs, um, the, the, the main focus is to support direct service providers that are serving youth in the community. So um, just wanted to add that emphasis. Thank you, Marlon. Um, and I see another question here. Um, our, program our program time varies in the middle schools we serve. The scheduled program times vary from first period to lunch period to after school. Would we qualify? Um, the answer is so long as you operate at after school programming, you are eligible to apply. Um, with the caveat that all you cannot use AIM High grant funds to support programming that occurs during the regular school day. So the AIM High grant funds can only go to out of school time programming. Mm -hmm. So after school and summer programs and in some instances before school programs, although we don't get as many applications for that. And to add to that, um, some folks were asking weekend or, or breaks when school's on break, that would also qualify. Some, some schools were saying uh, some questions uh, were, some folks were asking questions around weekend programming and um, school holiday break programming. So that would also qualify. Thank you, Marlin. Uh, let's see, continuing to 
comb through. Um, here we have a question about letters of support. Um, we actually do not even have a space for letter, letters of support to be submitted in the back end. Um, you can mail them to us. They're certainly not encouraged. Um, they don't hurt, but they don't necessarily help um, because it's difficult for us to comb those into or to kind of integrate those into the process since they're not included as part of the application platform. And, and also to add that there is an opportunity in the application where um, it's, you know, would you like to include other information? So there is an opportunity to include something that perhaps you feel was not addressed in the application questions. So when you get to that point, you can feel free to elaborate more on something that, you know, wasn't uh, discussed previously in the application, or you feel some of the questions didn't cover. So there is a point where you can um, include additional information. Thank you, Marlon. Um, and I've seen, we also got a couple questions about um, uh, programs that are affiliated with United Way. Um, I'm going to assume, although it's not in the questions, that the organizations that uh, would want to apply uh, that are affiliated with United Way are basically asking if they can use the United Way as a fiscal agent. Um, the answer is unfortunately no. If your organization is not a 501c3 and or does not meet the budget requirements itself and you were hoping to use the United Way to meet that eligibility requirement, um, that would not be an, a, a situation in which we would allow them to be um, your fiscal uh, agent. Um, however, we have had uh, in the past uh, multiple instances where a United Way applied to um, uh, receive a grant that uh, would see pass-through funding to a number of partners. In that scenario, the United Way is the primary applicant. They submit the application, um, but we have awarded some of those um, in which uh, the United Way um, uses some of the grant funds provided by AIM High um, as pass-through to other partners in the community. Um, a maximum of 50% of the total amount of the AIM High grant um, can be made pass through funding to non 501c3 organizations. So uh, no more than half of an AIM High grant can go to non 501c3s as part as pass through funding. So just to flag that um, for anyone who has a, an, a United Way affiliation. Um, I see a couple questions here about receiving uh, federal or state funding or 21st Century Community Learning Center uh, funding. Uh, so long as you meet the other eligibility requirements, um, it doesn't really matter whether your program uh, has more public or private support. Um, there's no reason that a 21st Century program would not be eligible to apply or a program that receives other federal, state, or local uh, public funding would not be eligible to apply so long as you meet all those other eligibility requirements, including the 501c3 requirement, which is where we see occasionally see um, some 21st century programs don't have um, 501c3 registration with the IRS. Um, so that's uh, one thing to keep an eye out for. Let's see. Um, I'm seeing a question here um, asking about whether or not programming that occurs on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays uh, are, are considered eligible uses of funding. So yes, you, as long as it's not during the traditional school day, um, that is uh, within the quote unquote realm of out of school time programming. Um, so as part of your grant, you can include programming that occurs on those days. And in the past, we have seen some applicants that propose uh, Saturday and or Sunday funding uh, or programming and do receive funds. I see a question here asking about um, kind of uh, dosage, meaning the number of hours per day or per week that youth spend in programs um, as compared to number of youth served. Uh, there isn't a strong preference for serving more kids or serving the kids that you serve for more time. Um, it's kind of up to the reviewers to figure out whether or not 
the amount of funding you're requesting is a good match for the number of youth that you are serving or are proposing to serve and the amount of time that those kids are spending in programming. It's very much up to the um, uh, individual reviewers to make that determination. Okay, and I noticed that we're actually already a couple minutes past the hour. Uh, Marlon, any last questions you noticed that you wanna address before we um, close out? Uh, no, I just wanna say that there are a lot of questions and I know probably some folks feel like your specific question wasn't answered. So that's certainly not our intent. Um, we will take the questions. We will update the FAQs. So, you know, if it wasn't ans answered, ask it. Um, you have the email because um, we certainly want you to feel like you're being heard and be helpful. So thank you all for the work that you do in the community. And we look forward to reviewing the applications, Dan. Yeah, well, uh, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, and I'd like to take a moment again to thank um, uh, Marlin and for 